The Civil Kubernetes Cloud has gotten quite popular lately, so I decided to try it out and see what it's like, what we can do with it, and if it's worth investing the time to learn a new cloud. Let's get into it. Hey, welcome back to Career Day, where we try and do DevOps just better. Today we talk about the Civil Kubernetes Cloud, and quick disclaimer, this video is not sponsored by Civil. They don't know that I'm making this video, and all the tests I've done I've done it paying with my own money or anyway using the free grant that they, they give. Um, more on this later. This video is, however, supported by all the people that subscribe to my Patreon. So if you want to be like them and get more content and Q&A and support all the video on this channel, go to uh, patreon.com slash coderdave and check the options. So what is Civil Kubernetes Cloud? Well, they said that they are the first cloud native service provider powered only by Kubernetes and they promise to be cheap, fast, and have a simple developer experience. And I can tell you that, for what I've seen, most of those claims are true, but um, I found also things that I didn't like that much. So in this video, I'm gonna go through all the things I liked, all the things I didn't like, so you can have a general picture about the service. So let's start with the things I did like. First of all, it's very cheap like really, really cheap. You can start with just $5 a month, five US dollars a month. Of course, you will not get a lot for $5. You get like one CPU and one gig of RAM, enough for starting and trying out the service. And apart from that, it's anyway much cheaper than many other cloud providers like AWS, GCP, or Azure with prices that are usually half the cost of those other cloud providers or even less than a half. And all these prices are transparent, so you always know what you're paying for and how much you're paying. And apart from that, you get 250 US dollars for free when you sign up that you can consume until the end of the next month, uh, the next month from when you're signed. So you can use a lot of those services basically for free. And that's what I've done for the majority of the tests I've done, as I said before, I did pay for other stuff, but in general, the $250 uh, that they give you were enough to test all of the things I wanted to. All right, second thing I like is that it's really, really fast. The provisioning of resources is fast. The deletion is super fast. The provisioning in my experience has been a little slower than the maximum 90 second they claim they provide, but in general is much faster than other clouds. And I think they say the average is around 70 seconds for provisioning a cluster, which anyway, it's, it's a very, very good timing, even if it's a little bit longer than that. And as I mentioned, the deprovisioning is almost immediate, so no worries about that. And speaking about fast things, also the support is really fast. I had a couple of glitches, and I'll talk about those uh, a little bit later, but the support was able to help me, was replying very, very quickly via the chat provided in, in the portal, and they were able to solve all the problems I had either immediately or just taking a day, maybe talking with the engineering in the background. So no, no issues with that. They are really fast service and support. As I mentioned before, another point that Civil Cloud uh, claims is they have a simple developer experience. And I can say that it's fairly accurate. Uh, they have, for example, an application marketplace from which you can install very, very easily with just some clicks the applications in your cluster. And they have a, like a bunch of applications that you can choose from, whether they are architectural application, like ingress, gateways, or monitoring stuff, or databases, you name it. And it's really easy because you don't have to install that using you know, Helm charts or, or scripts. You just click a button when you provision your cluster or you have a label in your Terraform configuration, for example, and uh, Civil Cloud takes care of that for you. And that's really, really easy. Another thing that I like is that they are not only offering Kubernetes cluster at the moment, but they also have uh, VM instances. The prices are basically the same. Uh, the specs are slightly different, especially in the storage space, but in general, uh, the same performances, the same ease of use and the same speed. So good for that. And one more thing I like is that they try to appeal to non-professional uh, developers or people that don't have much knowledge of Kubernetes and trying to make them learn and get better at managing and provisioning Kubernetes. In fact, they do have an academy space in which you can have a ton of courses and learning material to learn how to operate Kubernetes, how to manage Kubernetes clusters, and everything related to Kubernetes. And they also have something called KubiQuest, 
uh, that basically, as the name says, are some quests and tasks that you can do uh, guided against your Kubernetes clusters and claim the progress as you go. And again, that helps you uh, learning the tools and the technologies as you go in a very fun and easy way. And in general, the last point I like is that, that everything is community driven. You can get community feedback, uh, you can submit uh, suggestions, and you can even submit tutorials and documentation to make the platform growing. And as much as I like it, this is also the first point for me that is something I don't really like. And I'm talking about the documentation. As I mentioned, also the documentation is community driven. And that unfortunately means that the, their documentation is all over the place. You have multiple pages and tutorials about the same things. For example, you have uh, at least three different versions of starting with Terraform and each one provides a different example. And one is even wrong because it uses the resources for Terraform that are reserved for the VMs to provision a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster. And I've actually used that by error, by mistake when I started and the cluster was not working properly. I couldn't understand why. And then I found out that, yeah, the, the documentation was wrong. So I was following the wrong example. And in general though, apart from mistakes, the documentation is all over the place. It's very chaotic. It's very difficult to find what you're looking for and the version of what you're looking for, because as I mentioned, there are different versions of the same topics and tutorials. So you need to be a little bit careful about that. And since I was talking about Terraform, um, the Terraform provider is another thing I don't really like. In the official documentation on the Terraform registry, the documentation is not complete. For example, you don't have a definition or you don't have clear specifications of the nodes or the size of the nodes in the clusters that you can use. And in general, it's, it's not very well done. And also, as I mentioned before, I had some glitches and basically all the glitches I had is because I recently started using Terraform for all my cloud definitions. So I wanted to use Terraform also to uh, you know, manage Civo Cloud. And so I started doing that and I encountered a, a number of issues in which my clusters were not working properly. They were working properly when provisioned uh, from the portal. But when I was working with them from the uh, from Terraform, basically using the Terraform provider, then uh, one time the load balancer was not working. Another time, uh, you know, the nodes were not able to scale up and down um, and things like that. Now, the support was able to to look into that and solve that for me. And I guess they solve it for everyone. I hope they didn't solve it just for my account. But in general, it felt like not many people were using Terraform with Sivo, which surprises me. But in general, yeah, the, the, the experience with Terraform was not great and we, the Terraform provider was not great. Uh, one thing I didn't like is that when I've subscribed for the service, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't create clusters. I couldn't create VMs. I just could set some settings and that was it. They have apparently like a manual validation or I think it's a manual validation of your account. And for me, uh, probably because I'm in not US time zone, I'm in Hong Kong. It took several hours to be able to actually get the account approved. So for, for the moment, I subscribed for the service until when I was actually able to finally start and provision a first cluster. I think it was six or seven hours. Again, it's not a super big deal and it happens only for the first time when you uh, join or when you subscribe for the service. But when I do something like that, I want to be able to start right away, especially because it's not written anyway before you subscribe that uh, the verification needs to take place. Because if I knew, maybe I would have done it the night before and let, leave it there um, and come in the morning and have it approved. But I've done it when I actually was uh, in need to start using the service. And those five, six, seven hours, whatever it was, uh, I felt like it was a little bit too long for for me to, to wait. Another thing that I want to mention that I don't necessarily like is that it's not as user friendly, if you will, um, compared to other clouds, especially when it comes to monitoring and in general operations on your cluster. For example, you don't have a dashboard in which you can see how the cluster is performing uh, or anything like that. Like for example, you would have in AWS or, or, or Azure. 
uh, you need to install uh, the Kubernetes dashboard or Prometheus or any, any other tools like that. But that, of course, will eat out of your resources in the cluster, while on other cloud providers, you have some dashboard pre-built from the cloud provider that uses their own APIs. And then you don't need to install anything on your cluster. You don't have to maintain it and anything like that. So that is something I really wish they had because if it's true that they try to streamline and make the developer experience simpler, on the operations side, uh, there is basically nothing out of the box that you can get to monitor and operate your cluster. And still comparing Civo with other cloud providers, there's nowhere I could find in which they mention how they achieve or they plan for high availability HA. For example, in Azure or AWS, and I think also in GCP, you have something called availability zones in which you can place your nodes of your cluster and uh, you make sure that if one availability zone goes down, then the other is safe and so on and so forth. I couldn't find anything like that in the documentation of SIBO. I'm sure, I hope, they do some sort of HA or disaster recovery, but I couldn't find it mentioned it anywhere. So I think it's something that you need to be uh, aware of, that you need to consider if you try and use those services for other things rather than development. And final, final thing that I didn't like, this is the last one, I, I, I promise. Um, they have a quota system in place. And again, I do understand why that is. You don't want anyone to over provision your clusters and consume their resources for everyone else. But I felt like the quotas are not as big. But I remember I was trying to scale uh, to a cluster of five, um, five nodes and I couldn't do that because I didn't have enough quota. And you can get increment in your quotas but you need to contact them, explain why you need it, uh, you know how much you need, for what you need. And also, you can do that apparently only after you've repaid your first invoice. So if you are inside the, the trial period or the $250 that they provide you for free, then my understanding is that you cannot ask for a quota increase. You can do that only when you are a paid client. Again, not a super big deal. Uh, the quota is plenty for development purposes or for small workloads or for testing the service out, but it can be a little bit of a limitation if you want to have a bigger cluster or a bigger workload, or if you have multiple people that need to spin up clusters for development purposes, for example. In general, though, I would say the, I did like the service. Um, I would probably not recommend it for production purposes, but definitely if you want to do dev, if you want to do tests, QA, or if you want to try the service out, definitely recommend it. As I mentioned, it's very cheap. It's very fast. It works fairly well. Again, I had some problems with Terraform, but in general, then those have been solved and provisioning the cluster from the portal also uh, worked from, from the beginning. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good service. Um, I think most of the thing or some of the things I consider negative for me are because I come from more an enterprise kind of uh, vision. And also they may be considered like nitpicking. But it's something that I think you needed to know and you need to you know, um, be aware of if you're going to use the service. So as I said, I would probably recommend it for dev and test purposes, maybe QA. I would recommend it if you want to, since they, they are very quick in provisioning the clusters, if you have IAC, if you have your Terraform script, you can spin up the environment you know, uh, on the fly, do whatever you need to do and then destroy it. And so you pay only for that period of time. So that is definitely something I would do with this service. In terms of the availability of the service, it's not currently super spread out around the world. They do have three regions though, one in Europe, in London, UK, another one in Europe, in Frankfurt, Germany, and the last one in New York City in the US. It can cover, I would say, EMEA and US. For Asia, it's a little bit limited. I was using the one in London. And of course, the latency to connect to the service was a little bit higher than uh, what I expect or what I experienced when I use Azure, for example, here in Asia. But in general, it was not, was not a big deal. It was not a problem. And especially if you use it for development purposes, it's totally fine. So to close this up, I would say, yes, overall, a good service. I would use this service and I will use this service for development purposes. Um, I personally will not put production workloads in it just yet and not with the current state. 
And now that I know that the documentation is a little bit messy, that the Terraform provider may be quirky, I'll put more attention in that and try to find the information I need. But let me know in the comment section below if you've tried Sivo before, if you like it, and if you use it for what you use it. The Sivo Kubernetes cloud got much, much. So I've decided to give it a go, give it a spin. They are the first cloud native cloud. And apart from that, it costs mass, mass. They don't only offer Kubernetes clouds. Check out this video over here in which I talk about code spaces in GitHub and how to use that for development environments as well. But that's it for me. Thanks so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it. Hit the like button below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I see you in the next video here at Core Dave.